<clears throat> Matthew 6, 19 to 34. Do not store for your, up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. <clears throat> no one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. <clears throat> Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Well, it's been a couple of weeks since we've all been together. Um, like I said, we, we called off uh, church last week because of the snow, which is still hard for me to believe. And I promise you that you will not get two sermons this Sunday to make up for that. I, I do, however, want to give you a little synopsis of what I said uh, last week, and there's a reason for that. Last week, the scripture was the, the section of scripture surrounding the Lord's Prayer, which is not just about prayer. It's actually about three different things. There's almsgiving, which is giving to the needy. There's prayer, and then there is also fasting. Now, Jesus critiques some of the leaders in that culture who were doing these things not really for God, but also to put on a show for other people, to be seen by others. Jesus critiques them and says, you really shouldn't do that. Instead, you should go do these things in secret, where only God can see them, and then only God will reward you. The reason those things are important is because they were three key ways that people showed their devotion to God or showed their worship to God, which means the message for us really has to do with not putting on a show in worship, but rather worshiping God from the heart. And I'm telling you, it was a good sermon, if you missed it. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, if you are interested in seeing uh, that sermon, we actually uh, I uploaded a version of it to our YouTube channel, so you can go over there and check it out. Although, if you're watching this sermon on YouTube, hi everybody up there, uh, we'll put a link in the description. Half of you don't know what that means, but Curtis does. So, um, we're, we're heading into new territory here, people, it's fun. Now, the reason that I wanted to mention that about last week's sermon is because it does tie into our sermon today. Uh, we are in the middle of a series on the Sermon on the Mount. We've been working our way through it fairly steadily, and we will uh, continue on until right before Easter. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is really the first major thing that Jesus does in the story of the Gospel of Matthew. And quite frankly... The Sermon on the Mount is a big deal. It still is a big deal today, but it definitely was back when he said it. Jesus talks a lot about the kingdom of heaven, or, or establishing the kingdom of heaven, or bringing the kingdom of heaven. 
Now, the kingdom of heaven in Matthew really is this upside down and backwards kind of way of living. And in the Sermon on the Mount, that's where he really lays out what it means to be in the kingdom of heaven and what it looks like. Now, up until this point in our scripture, Jesus has talked a fair bit about the kingdom of heaven, but it's in our scripture today where Jesus gets really clear about saying, no, you need to put the kingdom of heaven first, above everything else. Verse 33 really is sort of the key to this entire section of Scripture, which is, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. That's the main point of this entire section. So keep that in mind as we dive in a little bit closer to each of these uh, different parts of this Scripture. Verses 19 to 34, which is our whole scripture for today, really has four different parts to it. There are three shorter sayings that show up at the beginning and then a longer section on worrying or not worrying later on. Each of these sections really has the main point that we need to be focusing on the kingdom of God first. It sets up this contrast between the kingdom of God and the things of this world. Interestingly, when Jesus sets up that contrast, in basically all of these uh, different parts, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is contrasted against accumulating wealth and possessions. It's an interesting contrast that we can definitely see in the first section, verses 19 to 21, where he talks about storing up treasures in heaven and not on earth. Now, there's a little bit of a hair theological hair that I want to split here because I think it is important. There is a certain vein of uh, theology that would say, um, that has taken this to mean, well, we shouldn't be worried about accumulating things here, but rather we can accumulate things in heaven. It's really sort of the same mentality, it's just applied to an afterlife. This shows up in, um, oh, places like we've all heard the phrase, uh, earning stars in your crown uh, in heaven and that kind of thing. There's also an old song Old timey, good old song called "Mountain Over the or Mansion Over the Hilltop." Uh, I love that song. The theology is uh, kind of rough <laughs> at points. Uh, there's some really good things about it, but basically the premise of the song is that when we die and go to heaven, we'll have all of this stuff: the streets of gold and mansions and robes and crowns and all that kind of stuff. Which the problem with that is that it still kind of continues this mentality of being self-centered about accumulating stuff for us, which is not really the point that Jesus is making in this scripture. What he's really saying is, stop centering on all of your own things, <laughs> on accumulating stuff for yourself, but instead focus on what God wants for this world. Turn your attention to God's kingdom and what God wants you to do. That's the point of this first section of scripture. It's really not just about accumulating more stuff. The second saying is an interesting one to me because it seems a little bit out of place. The other three pretty clearly talk about uh, possessions or wealth or material things in some form. And the second one talks about eyeballs. <laughs> uh, it's sort of an odd thing to put in there in this section. And there's a lot of different ways that this has been interpreted over the generations. But I think if we put this if we keep this uh, little saying in the context of these other three parts, we can also see that the, even this really is about the kingdom of heaven and literally keeping our attention or our focus on the kingdom. Jesus starts by talking about physical eyes and says that if your physical eyes are healthy, they, your world is filled with light. You can see the world clearly and you can navigate through it. But if your eyes are unhealthy, then it clouds things and makes things dark and it's difficult to navigate through the world. He's essentially saying that the same is true spiritually. If our eyes are healthy, that means that we can see what God wants for this world. We can see God's will and God's kingdom, and then we will live in the light. We will be able to navigate our world as it really is. But if our eyes are unhealthy and we don't understand God's will, then we wind up living in darkness. Even that, again, is about putting the kingdom of God first. The third section is something of a difficult one because it brings 
Jesus' point into a harsh black and white focus. There's a lot of other places in Scripture where Jesus talks in parables or he kind of implies things. He gives sort of a softer kind of message. This is not that. This third section about not serving two masters feels a little bit more like taking a two-by-four to the face. It is clear. It is blunt. There's no getting around it. Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. Your heart cannot be in two different places. You're going to love one and hate the other. The word that Jesus uses here for wealth is mammon. And it really uh, is not just about money. It's about possessions and it's about the um, the whole idea of chasing after material possessions in this world. And Jesus says, look, it's one way or the other. You can't be in the middle. And even though he doesn't explicitly say it, the implication is you need to choose God <laughs> and choose the kingdom of heaven. Now the third, the, now the fourth section elaborates on that theme a little bit more. The first three sections really are telling us to keep our focus on the kingdom of heaven. And they set up this idea of the kingdom of heaven being opposed to uh, wealth or uh, possessions or, or that kind of thing. In the last section, Jesus gives a little bit of a spin on that. What I find interesting is that he continues this idea of the kingdom being opposed to to, uh, physical need or physical things, particularly worrying about physical things or being anxious about physical things. But what's fascinating is that in this section, Jesus does acknowledge that we need certain physical things. Jesus says that we need certain things, possessions in our life in order to survive. The issue is that Jesus is saying that we don't need to worry about those things. We don't have to become preoccupied with those things because God knows that we need them. And God will give us everything that we need. Jesus says, look at the, look at the weeds in the, in the field and the birds in the air. God takes care of them. What makes you think God wouldn't take care of you? Verse 32 even says that the Gentiles are the ones who worry about all of those things, but God knows that we need them, and God will provide them for us. See, in some ways, it's not really just about the stuff itself. It's, whether, it's about whether or not we are preoccupied with getting the stuff. It's a matter of where our first priority is. What are we really working for? What are we really worried about? Who are we really concerned with pleasing? Is our first priority the stuff of this world or is our first priority the kingdom of heaven? The promise from Jesus that we have in response to those questions is something of a counterintuitive one. Jesus says that if our first priority is chasing after the stuff of this world, well, that that stuff isn't going to last. It's going to rust and it's going to rot. And if we're focused on getting all of that stuff, we're going to miss out on the kingdom of heaven too, which means at the end of it all, we're going to have nothing. But if we go after the kingdom of heaven first, then God will provide us with everything that we need, which means in the end we wind up with everything. Again, verse 33 really is the key to understanding this. Strive first for the kingdom of heaven. And then God will give you everything you need as well. This verse mirrors the Lord's Prayer in a pretty important way. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray first that God's kingdom would come. That God's will would be done. And then after that, we pray for our daily bread, our needs to be met. And in this scripture for this morning, we have the promise that when we do work for God's kingdom, when we pray that prayer, that our prayers will be answered and that our needs will be met. Our scripture for today is a key part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's also been a key part of what it means to be brethren. Throughout brethren history, this has been a section of Scripture that has influenced us and shaped us 
in some very important ways, at least two major ways that I see. The first of which has to do with the idea of simplicity. In this scripture, Jesus really sets up this idea of wealth, being opposed, wealth and accumulation being opposed to the kingdom of heaven. Now, there are three ways that people have interpreted this over the generations. The first is to say, well, Jesus is really saying that it's about, you know, um, not the money itself, but really how you use it, whether it's use it for good things or bad things. So, you know, it doesn't really matter how much money you accumulate in the end. There's a, another interpretation that's sort of the opposite of that, saying, oh, no, 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 no. Wealth and possessions is completely opposed to the way of following Jesus. So if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to give up everything and live a life of poverty. I mean, there are thousands of monks who t- have taken vows of pos- poverty because of that interpretation. Brethren, however, have taken an interesting third option, which is to say that God's intent for humans is neither wealth nor poverty, but rather God's intent for humanity is a modest lifestyle where needs are met and excess is avoided. Where needs are met and excess is avoided. When brethren have talked about simplicity, that's really what they have tended to mean over the years, which I personally think is a very close reading of verse 33. Work for the kingdom of heaven first, and God will give you everything that you need, not necessarily all of the extravagance of life. This understanding of simplicity has been a foundational part of the brethren, of brethren lifestyle for hundreds of years. We look to have our needs met, but not necessarily to live a life of excess, which, interestingly, is something that has allowed us to be very generous and to meet the needs of others. Our theology of simplicity is very tied to our theology of service and helping others as well. This understanding of simplicity really is an expression of the kingdom of heaven made real here and now, and it's a central part of who the brethren have been from the very beginning. The other way that this scripture has influenced brethren has to do with this whole idea of seeking the kingdom of God before everything else. One of the main reasons that the brethren started in 1708 was because they wanted to follow Jesus, period. They wanted to follow Jesus above everything else, and they were willing to strip away everything that got in the way of doing that. Now, when I say that they were willing to strip away everything that got in the way of following the kingdom of heaven, that included stripping away the church, at least as an institution or, or a structure. When you look at the early history of the brethren, they basically threw out everything that anyone would recognize as the church. They threw away all of the official prayers. They threw away the creeds. They, they rejected the priestly hierarchy and structure. They even rejected church buildings at all. For the first 100 years of our existence as, as a people, we didn't have church buildings. We were a house church movement. Because, as one person put it, brethren do not go to a church. Brethren are the church when they gather together. The bigger reason that they were willing to strip away all of this stuff, all of this structure, really, I think, has to come, or comes back to this whole idea of seeking the kingdom of heaven before everything else. I don't know if, the, if Alexander Mack and the others would have quite said it this way, but I think in some way they understood that, that the structure or the institution of church itself can actually become just like another worldly possession. The church as an institution is something that we can get caught up in, that we can become obsessed with, that we can become infatuated with, that we spend all of our time and energy worrying about maintaining and preserving a particular institution or structure. When the, what the early brethren saw was that when you get so caught up in the institution of church, it's actually possible to completely miss Jesus and, to, and completely miss the kingdom of God. I think that's part of what Alexander Mack and the others in 1708 saw in the churches that were around them. I think they saw people that were consumed by the 
institution of church, and, the, and in the process, people who had completely missed out on the kingdom and Jesus. Those early brethren chose to seek God's kingdom first and strip away anything else that got in the way of that. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that brethren have thought that the institution of church is unnecessary. And I'm certainly not saying that either. In fact, I would say quite the opposite. The church, I believe, is still God's primary tool for working in this world. But at the end of the day, it is still a tool to accomplish something much bigger. See, there's a certain parallel in our Scripture. The church is a bit like the things that Jesus talks about in our Scripture. Things like food or drink or clothes and so on. Just as those physical things are actually necessary for life, I think the church structure is necessary as well. The problem is that when it comes to those physical things, Jesus tells us that if our main goal is to accumulate stuff, that we'll wind up with nothing in the end. And I think in a similar way, if our main goal is to preserve an institution, well then we're going to wind up with nothing in the end. But the flip side is also true which is that when it comes to physical necessities, if we seek the kingdom of God first, then God will provide us with everything that we need. And when it comes to the church, if our main goal is to join together with other followers, other believers, and to seek the kingdom of heaven here and now, then I believe that God will give us the church structure that we need in order to accomplish that goal. See, I think that's what the early brethren were doing in 1708. Alexander Mack and the others were not actually trying to start another denomination or another church. In fact, that's why we have the name that we do. They simply called themselves brothers and sisters rather than giving a new label to start something new. Their main goal was simply to follow Jesus. That's what they were doing. Anything that you could call a church structure that has come after that is simply in service of that first goal. That's why when you look at our history of the last 300 years, we can see that the structure and the institution of church has always continually been changing. The reason is because it's changing to meet the, the first goal of following Jesus in our day and our age. In some ways, it's a bit ironic to me that we've even wound up with something called a denomination. Because all along, the whole point of our movement has never really been to start a new church. The point of our movement has been to follow Jesus and to seek the kingdom of God. Which is an important message for us today. Our scripture has something very powerful within it. It was powerful when Jesus said it. It's powerful. It was powerful when our brethren ancestors heard it. And it's powerful for us today. The message is that whether it is in our personal lives or our lives together as a church, we are called to have a singular focus on striving for the kingdom of heaven. And we are also given the promise that when we do that, God will give us everything that we need. Amen.